Welcome, everyone. My name is David Ibanda, and I'm the host of this podcast, Those Who Came Before Us. In this show, I'll take a particular African group and talk about their history, especially the pre-colonial portion. After that, I'll discuss how that history affects the modern day nation that that group is in. That means this is going to be a series of episodes on one group. This is my way of teaching myself African history. I realize how utterly pathetic my understanding was of my roots. With this, I learn and study something and share it with everyone. My hope is that whatever I share will be of interest to you too. And what better place to start than my own home? I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am an African Canadian, particularly from Uganda. My father is a Musoga. My mother is Mnyankore. I understand most of you will not know what this means, but hopefully after listening to my podcast, you'll be more familiar. Some of you will finally know more about Uganda than just Idi Amin and Joseph Kony. So, I'm going to start with the Kingdom of Unyoro, a kingdom that both my father's and mother's tribes are descended from. With that, let us begin. The Unyoro Chitara Kingdom has been in existence for over a thousand years. It's currently located in present-day Western Uganda, where it's now a cultural institution as opposed to a political one as it used to be in the past. It's a shadow of its former self. But Winyoro was once a feared empire. It was once the most powerful and influential state in the Great Lakes region. It's said that in its heyday, it covered almost all of Uganda, Western Kenya, Northern Tanzania, Eastern Congo, Rwanda, and some even say part of Ethiopia. Now, depending on who you ask, the extent of their empire varies. Historians themselves can't seem to agree on both its extent or whether it actually existed. But whatever you believe, know that Bunyoro was a force to be reckoned with, one whose prestige was recognized by the many groups in the East African Great Lakes region. However, by the 19th century, the kingdom had been losing its power for years. This was due to a number of reasons, such as civil wars caused by rebellious princes, the numerous wars with the emboldened and growing power of Buganda, who were their longtime rivals. Other reasons include the arrival of foreigners such as the Arab slave traders, the Egyptians as a result of Khedif Ismail Pasha's ambition. He wanted to establish an equatorial empire that stretched from Egypt all the way down to the Great Lakes. And of course, we cannot forget the British who took over Uganda during the era of new imperialism in the late 1800s. But we'll get into all of that later. For now, I'd like to start from the beginning with Winyora's very own creation story. In the beginning, the Banyura believed that there were two beings in existence, Ruhanga the creator and his brother Ncha. Now Ncha complained that life was dull because nothing had been created. Whenever he looked out into the expanse of the universe, all he could see was darkness. So Ruhanga pointed upwards with his right hand and created heaven. With his left, he pointed downwards and made earth. He then picked up a stone and flung it high into the sky. With a bang, it burst into flames and became the sun. This new creation, while fascinating, terrified Ncha. He quickly realized that there was one big problem. Its heat. It was unbearable. He had nowhere to hide from the sun. It was like being stuck on a never-ending desert. When Ruhanga, who wasn't at all bothered by the heat, saw this, he pulled the sun to the west and covered it with a cloud. He then picked up a stone for the second time and hurled it into the air. It started to emit a bright white light and became the moon. Ruhanga then turned to his brother and ordered him to fall asleep. As he slept, he created a rooster to wake him up in the morning. Night passed and the sun rose and then Chao was confronted once again by the inescapable heat. Eh, that thing is going to melt me, he told Ruhanga. The creator then made trees and tall grass, thus providing shade and Nchao was comfortable. For now. In those days, it said that heaven was close to earth. 
it was propped up by three things. A bar of iron, the bar cloth tree, and the Ugandan coral tree. So Rohanga decided to check on things in heaven. When he got there, he noticed that his hands were dirty from creation. He washed them and the water fell to earth, drenching in cha in the process. He screamed in anger, Ah! What is that? In what I can assume was a booming godly voice, Rohanga responds, That is rain. To which Incha replies, I am going to need shelter if you do that again. Rohanga suggests that he should perhaps break branches off a tree and use them to create shelter. He tried, but failed because he wasn't strong enough. So Rohanga picked up a stone for the third time and broke it into three pieces. These pieces became a knife, a hammer, and an axe. He then gave them to his brother, and he used them to cut the necessary materials for shelter. And Chai is satisfied once again. But the new creation didn't hold in Chai's interest for too long. He still found himself bored. Ah, uh, give me something to look at. Everything here is so boring. He complained. So Rohanga created flowers, wild beasts, birds, and insects. And the earth came alive like it had been given a soul. One day, while Ruhanga and Incha were talking, Incha asks him, Why do I have a body? What is the papas of the stomach? His brother said nothing, but carved a bowl from a tree he cut, then created a cow and poured its milk into it. Incha drinks this and says it's good, but that he could use something more filling. Ruhanga then buried a creeper plant, and it soon bore fruit. He took the fruit and put them into a clay pot which he set on top of three anthills. He gathered firewood and started to cook the fruit. Ruhanga told his brother to watch the food and poke it with a stick and he'll know it's ready when the fruit is soft. When the food was ready, and Chao was so impatient that he reached into the pot to grab the food and burned himself in the process. Ruhanga admonished him and told him that the proper way to do this was to turn the food onto the leaves that he had put on the ground. And Chao ate the food and gave his approval. With this, Ruhanga proclaimed that all the needs of his brother had been met. He also said that it probably would have been a good idea if Incha hadn't listened to his stomach, because now it would be his master, causing work, pain, and theft. And that is how the world came into being for the pre-colonial Banyoro. Now, I just want to make it clear. This is one version of the story. Like other creation myths, there are multiple tales, and they all differ from each other in one way or another. The version I'm telling is from Ruth Fisher's Twilight Tales of the Black Baganda, <laughs> a title that had nothing to do with the people that she was writing about. Let me put it to you this way. It would be like me writing a book about German history and then titling it Twilight Tales of the White French. It would be absurd. So... With that out of the way, let's talk about the story I just told. In the Banyoro creation myth, Incha is the everyman character that we're supposed to relate to. He's of divine origin, yet ordinary and powerless like us humans. He needed the guidance and oversight of his brother Ruhanga in order to survive, much like a child needs a parent, or a younger needs an older brother. The story doesn't explicitly mention the difference in age between the two, but it does remind us of that latter relationship. It's no wonder that other versions of the story emphasize this relationship and outright state it. Incha is the younger, petulant brother, while Ruhanga is the older, well-seasoned one. And the relationship between brothers is something that is so central in Bunyoro historical stories. Brother fighting brother in a battle of a session, or, as in the story of creation, a brother looking after a younger brother. The second half of this tale is also about brothers and how they influence the beginnings and structure of Bunyara society. At some point, Encha has four sons. The eldest was named Kantu, which meant little thing, and the others were called Kana, meaning little child. See what I mean? All brothers. Now, whenever he called one of the Kana children, they would all come running. Sometimes Incha would have a present for one and he'd call out Kana, and they would all rush in and argue amongst themselves, saying that the gift was intended for them. Frustrated by this, 
and Chad turned to his brother Ruhanga for help. So he decided to create a test for the three children. He invited the boys to his house and when there, left to go to the crossroads on the way to Incha's house. Once there, he leaves sweet potatoes and millet in a basket, strips of cow hides, and a cow's head at the center of the crossroads. He then went back to his house and gave each of the boys a present of a milk pot and sent them back to their father. While on their way home, they came across the items at the crossroads. Immediately, the oldest one took off towards the food and started to eat it. The other two brothers criticized him for this, but quickly decided that uh, they should get something for themselves too. The second oldest picked out the cow hides because he figured he could use them to tie the cows when he was milking them. The youngest grabbed the cow head and they all continued home. When they got home, they showed their father what they found. He got angry with them, but especially with the oldest for taking food that wasn't his and eating it with unwashed hands. And Jaw calls his brother and shows him what each child picked out. Rohanga looked at the items and decided to administer a second test. That evening, Rohanga gave each of them a pot filled with milk. Their task, to guard the milk for the whole night. So they sat there with their milk pots, trying their level best not to fall asleep and spill the milk. But at midnight, the youngest dozed and poured some of his milk. He quickly turned to his brothers and begged them to refill his pot. They obliged, and they all went back to guarding their pots till dawn. However, at the very last moment, the oldest fell asleep and toppled his pot. Frightened, he turned to his brothers for help, but they refused on the grounds that it would take a lot more milk for them to refill his than it did the younger one. It is at that moment that Ruhanga walked in and inspected their pots. He saw that the oldest one didn't have much milk left. The second, he saw, had a little taken out. Ruhanga asked him, Did you drink some? No. Oh God, I did not, but I did fill up my brother's pot. Ruhanga then called his brother in and told him the names of his children. The oldest, he cursed and named Kairu, meaning little servant. He was to grow food, gather firewood, build houses, and be subservient to his master. This was because he had eaten food on the road with unwashed hands and had spilled his milk during the night. The second oldest was named Kahuma meaning little herdsman. He was to be the herdsman for the one he had given his milk to. The youngest was named Kakama. He was to rule over all his brothers. His word was to be law. And thus, Bunyoro society was divided into three classes. The Bairu, who were the commoners or agriculturalists, the Bahuma, who were the herdsmen, and the Bakama, who would be the rulers. So, Let's go over what the boys picked out. The oldest picked up the food on the crossroads and gave some of his milk away to the youngest one. Not to mention, he spilled most of it at the end. Him picking up the food symbolized his eventual role as an agriculturalist, and by giving away his milk, that was an act of subservience to his master the king, who would later turn out to be his little brother. The second one, now named Kahuma, picked up the strips of cowhide, which he felt would be useful to tie the cows when milking them. He was already thinking like a herdsman from early. And just like his older brother, him giving milk to the youngest foreshadowed his eventual servitude. Lastly, Kakama, the youngest who became king, picked the cowhead, symbolizing his place as the head of his people. And unlike his brothers, Kakama never gave away his milk. He spilled it, yes but never gave it away to them. They rallied to his aid when he spilled his milk. He received like a king getting tribute. From here on out, their descendants were to belong to their respective classes. However, the caste system in Bunyoro wasn't so rigid. According to John Beatty, the ethnographer, it was still theoretically possible for a Mwiru to ascend to the highest positions in the land. With the exception being the Bakama, you had to be directly related to rule. You can't just have anybody becoming king now. Bunyora historian John Yakutura tells a slightly different origin story. In his version, the boys are not children of Ncha, but rather children of Chindu the first king. There was no Rohanga and no creation story. 
Yeah, Katura says that Chintu came from the north either from Sudan or from Abyssinia, which would be present-day Ethiopia. Now, ironically, their neighbor and rival Buganda's founder also has the same name. Is it the same person? Hmm, probably not. Either way the story goes, this marked the beginning of what is known as the Batembuzi dynasty, the first group of kings that ruled Winyoro. So, that is all for today, people. Thank you for listening. Wait a minute. Weren't there four sons? Aha! The oldest one named Kantu. He was the only one who had a name. According to the version told by Ruth Fisher in her book Twilight Tales of the Black Baganda, Kantu makes a comeback in the story. He returns and found out that not only did his brothers have names, but they had responsibilities too. Kantu felt overlooked and ignored by his uncle. Jealousy set in his heart and he goes out to commit evil, which is a tad bit dramatic, but from this point onwards, Kantu becomes a Satan-like character, rebellious, discontent, questioning. He can now possess people and convince them to commit vile acts, at least according to Fisher. His reaction to this highlights the importance of having a role to play in pre-colonial Bunyoro culture. To me, it also seems like a warning against those who don't play their part. If you don't, you risk becoming a rebel, an outcast like Kantu. Saranga saw this and told Incha that they needed to leave. He said, I quote, If we stay, shall we not kill him? Let us leave this place so we may not bring death into the world. Apparently at this point, death didn't exist in the human world. With that, Incha loosened the props that held heaven to earth. Heaven floated up, moving further and further away. The iron bar supporting it collapsed and broke into many pieces. This created the world's first iron deposits and bracelets. As for Kantu, he's said to have possessed his little brother Kagama and prompted him to do evil. Kagama eventually realized how bad things had become and gave the kingdom away to his son Baba. Shortly afterwards, he disappeared. Now, under the new kingship of Baba, the kingdom flourished. But not for long, because Kantu got envious again and asked Ruhanga to take away humanity's desire for food. He complied. It isn't explained why Ruhanga would oblige Kantu's request. I mean, after all, they were at odds. But nevertheless, by doing this, humans and beasts could no longer function since they had no strength. You know, because you gain energy by eating. This was all according to Kantu's plan, because in his despair, Baba developed feelings of resentment towards Rohanga because he believed this was his doing. And rightfully so. And Kantu, I guess aware of the sort of ego that befalls gods, uses this to his advantage and tells Rohanga what he heard Baba say. And predictably, he's not pleased. Rohanga says... Are not all things mine to create and to kill? Shall I not do what I like with a walk of my hands? You see, despite Ruhanga being the creator, he was often never the focus of worship. And I think the statement kind of encapsulates why. He plain out just said that he can do whatever he wants, so why bother praying to him? Fisher also mentions this in her book. Ruhanga was considered good and incorruptible. Therefore, any sort of offerings or prayers were considered some kind of bribe to get him to do what you wanted him to do. There was no way of currying favor with him. So, if you were a pre-colonial Munyoro and you got sick, or if you wanted vengeance towards that vagabond that set your house on fire in the dead of the night, your efforts were better spent contacting the spirits. Because with that, there was so much you could do. Getting back to the story... Ruhanga is furious after what he just heard, so he grabs two bags, which are joined together but have one opening, and releases their contents upon the world. What was in these bags was hunger and disease. Immediately, humanity's appetite returned. People feasted again, and the animals grazed once more. But as they gorged themselves, disease took a hold of them. Baba's son fell ill and died. And Baba was understandably confused by this, because death hadn't existed in the world before. Baba went to Ruhanga and told him that his son had fallen asleep and he wouldn't wake up. Upon hearing this, Ruhanga knew that death had come into the world. 
so he conferred with his brother and Cha about whether or not he should resurrect Matt on the fourth day. And Cha told him not to, because Matt was too sinful. Ruhanga told Baba to bury his son because he wasn't coming back. He was distraught. He wept bitterly over the grave of his son. It said that in his moment of grief, Kantu possessed Baba. And just like his father Kakama, he too disappeared. As I said before, this time period is known as the Batembuzi dynasty, a time ruled by the gods, which is why the story simply ends with a Mutembuzi king disappearing, such as with Kakama and Baba. The Banyura believed that the Batembuzi kings didn't die, but rather left for a faraway land. By the way, the word Mutembuzi is used to describe a king belonging to the Batembuzi lineage. So, that is all for today, people. I hope you enjoyed the story about the beginnings of Bunyoro society. Check back in two weeks for the next episode. You can also check out my Instagram page where I post some information about the episode content. The page is called TWCBU Pod. Again, that is TWCBU Pod. And I hope to catch you next time. Thank you for listening.